welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Let me get, while you're on your feet, let me get down on my knees and pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We haven't, like Pastor Luke said, we haven't come to hear from a man or woman. We've come to hear from the teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, and encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, that tonight as you bless us, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing and teaching the word of God. Lord, we bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary chapels and Harvest and Valley and Oasis. We thank you for the will and the way and we thank you God for all the great churches, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia Church. Lord, bless them as you would bless us and we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Tonight is part number one of how to have a great marriage. I feel if there's any subject in the world that I'm able by God to, to minister, it would be this subject. I wanna just share with you a couple of things, first of all, that Deborah sends her love her father's been in critical condition in the hospital in Washington State, and she's been up there all week long and just flew back in town maybe an hour ago, half an hour ago, and um, said she's just exhausted and needs to go home, So, and she's probably going to be asleep when I get there. And uh, I just want you to know that she'll be ministering throughout this time. It's an eight-week series, and I hope that you'll attend as many of them as you can get the CDs if you can't, and grow with us in the ways of the Lord. There's a major problem. Some of you that are in here today are on the verge of getting a divorce. Some of you are ready to get a divorce. Some of you can hardly wait to get a divorce. Some of you that are in here are people that are, marriages are pretty good and you're just sharpening. I don't want to say sharpening the ax. It just doesn't sound right when we're talking about marriage. But you know what I'm talking about. We're, we're actually you know, in there to develop your marital skills and make the marriage even better. Uh, there's nothing worse in a marriage than a bad, nothing worse in life than a bad marriage and nothing better in life than a good marriage. Except that's actually not true. There is something better than a good marriage. It's a godly marriage. And that's what we're going to find out about as we go to the word of the Lord today. You don't need to have an opinion of a man. Here's the reason why. And this is why I made out uh, my first starting out. I just started to say to you that I felt incredibly qualified to minister this subject. I've been on all sides of the spectrum. Before I was 25 years old, I was divorced three times. I never divorced anybody. They all threw me out. Married one woman twice. And she dumped me both times, married another woman uh, in 58 days. She lived me 58 days and threw me out. And uh, the last one as a Christian. And I, I found myself devastated at 25 years old. I actually went to a church and they actually threw me out because I had been divorced three times. They had concluded that I had to have major problems. And you know what, they were right, I had major problems. And I needed to find out if there was anything that in the world that I could do to make a marriage good, healthy and strong. Is there any way that this can work? I'd seen good marriages at home. My mom and dad had a good marriage, but it wasn't a godly marriage, but it was a good marriage. I'd seen bad and heard of bad marriages. I had had both of those and they were just horrible and my heart was broken. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been in the middle of a divorce or, or separation, you know as well as I do, there's a loss on the inside. It takes about six months to get over it. I, I cried myself to sleep every night for about six months on each of those occasions. I literally wanted to die. 
I wanted to die, but God, thank God, he wanted me to live. He wanted me to live because he had something about, not a good marriage, but something about a godly marriage. And I had to get in and find out what the scripture had said about a godly marriage because nobody ever, no matter how many churches I went to, never told me anything about how to have a godly marriage. Let me explain to you what I mean. If you're going to get a hamburger, go to In-N-Out. They know how to make hamburgers. Don't go to Taco Bell. They're not going to give you a good hamburger. But if you're going to have a marriage, go to the creator of marriage. Don't go to some place looking for a good marriage or a godly marriage and you're trying to get the information how to have a good godly marriage, a great marriage, if you will, trying to find the information from some other source. It just doesn't work. You've got to go to the creator of marriage. He knows how to make marriage work. And I didn't know that. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand the scripture. I just knew that I was broken hearted. And I tell you, I, I really, like many of you that are in here, wanted to die. If I could have prayed and died, I would have chosen death any time over, if you will, uh, continue living. Oh, thank God that God had a better plan for me. And I stand before you tonight, those of you that are on the edge of divorce, and I tell you that God has a better plan for you. But it's going to take something on your part. Now let me just say this to you very clearly. I'm going to get in your face about what it's going to take. You're not going to like it. You may at the end of the night not even like me. But I really don't give a flip. Because your future is actually more important than whether you like me or don't like me. I hope you never come to the Rock Church World Outreach Center and not get answers for where you're at with God. Because I went to church and never got answers for where I was at. I loved God, but my life was failing. My marriages have failed. I was broke and down and discouraged and literally wanted to die, but thank God, God rescued me, and he showed me clearly in Scripture what in the world it's going to take not to have a good marriage, but to have a godly marriage that leads to a great marriage. And I needed that so desperately, my friends. And I want you to hear me today. I'm going to take you somewhere in Scripture. You're going to say, what in the world does that got to do with marriage? And I'll explain to you that it has a lot to do with marriage because it starts out with dealing with your own personal heart. And that's what this is really all about. Matthew, if you will, 19th chapter, verse 16. I'll read to you these verses. They're familiar verses. You know them. Let me read to you. A man approaches Jesus. He's a very rich and very young man and makes a statement to Jesus. He says these words. <clears throat> Verse 16, And now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. <clears throat> now he's talking about keeping the word of the Lord that's good for you to operate by. He's not talking about just keeping the Ten Commandments. He's talking about a relationship with God that when God says something, you do it. And he makes this statement, verse 18, and he said to him, notice the capital H in the word him, which ones, Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all of these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, and here's the point, watch this. Listen to this verse. Jesus says to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor and 
you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man heard these sayings, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. When you read commentaries on this verse, you'll find that the problem is the man had too much wealth and couldn't get away. His heartstrings were attached to his own personality that was attached to, if you will, his wealth. And he finds himself in a place being confronted by God. God is not saying to you or me or anybody else, sell everything, give it to the poor. He's saying, a, making a statement. Because this verse is not talking about being wealthy or not being wealthy. This verse is talking about whether or not you are a person that's going to reverence God so much that anything and everything you have is not as important as your relationship with God. Because without that, everything fails. Let me say it again. Without that, everything fails. The problem is not wealth. The problem for most people in their marriages, in their business, in their homes, and finances is reverence. Reverence means it's an awe, a respect of who God is. That you don't respect that which you have, that which gives you identity, more than that which comes from God. And oftentimes we take in our lives a throne, and a throne, instead of having God on that throne, we have ourself on the throne. Our own personalities, our own wants, our own likes, our own wealth, our own finances, the things that we have. I will have time for God as long as it doesn't disrupt who I am or what I'm doing, or take from my material things that I have that please me. And we find ourselves in a problem. And the problem is not the wealth, because God's not against people with wealth. He's, the problem is with people, if you will, that find themselves drawing life from their wealth instead of drawing life from God. And when you are on the throne, instead of God being on the throne of your life, you can never hear what God says. You'll never get direction from God. You'll never do what God would have you to do. And quite frankly, your marriage will fail. Your children will fail. Your relationship with God will fail because there's only one seat on the throne and that's got to be God's, not yours. And without an understanding of that, nothing else works. Recently, I lost a close relative. My mom, who's 95 years old, said these words to me. She said, he did the best he could with God. When I got off the phone with her, I put the phone down and God spoke to me. And he said, no, he didn't. You know, you can't make excuses with God about where you're at. You know, there's a time now when you can get all the information you want about God. The Bible is open and being taught on a constant basis. You can read the scripture in the Holy Spirit. There'll be a teacher that'll teach you the word of God. There are no more excuses. You can't go to church and say, well, I went to that church all my life and they never taught me anything at all. Listen, you shouldn't have been in that church in the first place. And you can't go before God and make excuses for where you're at. You're either going to love God, you're going to respect God, be in awe about God so much that anything in your life isn't going to work and isn't on the throne of your life. In the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, God speaks oftentimes about sacrifice. One of the interesting sacrifices that he draws from oftentimes is you'll hear in the Old Testament about burnt offerings. Burnt offerings are an offering that you get from your sheepfold. You will take the most expensive part of your sheepfold, if you were a farmer or burnt offering, being a, 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 if you're a rancher and you were raising sheep, you would take the most expensive one, the one that was the cleanest, purest. You would take the one that was the whitest there was, and you would offer it on a fire, and it would burn itself to that place where there was nothing left but ashes. And that's why it was called a burnt offering. And it was offered to God as an expression from man to God. Do you know what the expression is saying? God, what I have is not as important as you. 
I don't care the things of this world, who I am. There's nothing like it at all, God. It's nothing but ashes to me. And it was accepted by God as a burnt offering because ashes have no life, have no possibility of anything. It's like cremation. If you've ever been around anybody and looked at somebody who's been cremated, it's all cremated down to a gray dust. And it's just a horrible thing that here was a human life and now it's gone and it's completely burned and it's worthless, has no life whatsoever, has nothing in it. And that's what a burnt offering is saying to God. God, what I have is not important. What's important is you. And I'll even burn this until it's not any worth at all and, and, and no value whatsoever so that I can express to you, God, that, that you are most important. We don't have those today. Today it's your heart before the Lord. Today the burnt offering is whether or not you see yourself as somebody that isn't living on the values of this world like this rich young ruler. Getting your identity from what you have or what way people treat you or your education or anything else. But you find yourself in a place where you are the burnt offering. There's nothing left of you except that which worships God. And when you get to that place, my, my friends, you are now in the right place in order for marriages and life and business and all the prosperity that God could possibly give you because God's waiting for you to get off the throne and put him on the throne. The problem with most we, few, uh, uh, the marriages is there's someone else on the throne instead of God on the throne in their marriage. Really important for us to see these simple principles. The word fearing God means I'm number one afraid of God and number two I'm in awe of who God is. I don't want to mess with God. I also want to respect him far beyond my feelings are second to his ways. My wants are second. To, uh, my wants aren't important. His wants are very important. And just like in that cremation, I have got to be somebody who's like dead to the things of this world, dead to my often personality, my wants and personality and wants and things of life. I got to be dead to it. I remember when Debbie and I were young ministers, we were in our 30s and we did our first uh, cremation ceremony. The man was from the mountains of Lake Arrowhead. We had a little church of about a hundred people. I'll never forget this. We went out. He wanted his ashes to be spread across the mountain. So we went out and we did a service and oh, we looked so spiritual. We preached and we sang and we did all the spiritual things and then it came time to take his ashes and spread them all out over the mountain. Just as I took off the top to spread those ashes, all over the mountain, a gust of wind came from the, the canyon and blew all of it back all over Deborah and I. We had black in our eyes and our teeth were great. Anybody want to kiss? It was absolutely a mess. And what I'm saying to you, the problem with that rich young ruler that we just read about wasn't his money wasn't his wealth. It's what he had someone else on the throne of his life. He had himself on the throne. He didn't want to give up what he had. He didn't want to get up his identity. He was an unusual person in the city. He was young and he was rich and he got attention because of it. And he couldn't give it up in order to follow Jesus. What an invitation to follow Jesus. That same invitation is yours tonight. Let me make a statement to you about how important reverencing God is. Because see, what I'm going to do is over the next eight weeks, there are eight commandments to the husband. Most people don't know that in scriptures. And there are four commandments to the wife. Most people don't even know what they are. Most people that are in here may know a part of one of them, but don't know it all. And if you can just do a few of them, God's going to bless you. And here's eight to the husband because there's so much responsibility on the man. And four to the wife because there's responsibility to be a woman in the family of God. And we don't know what they are and we wonder why our marriages limp along. 
instead of practicing what God says. But you will never, oh, hear me, you will never practice what God says until you have a heart that says, God, I want to follow you. You're more important. You're on the throne of my life. And you get out of the way and let God guide you and you do what God says. And that's called reverence. If I can, I'm going to take you real quick, Deuteronomy, in the 10th chapter, verse number 12. Let's set this foundation so that when you get these principles, you'll understand how to appropriate those eight and four principles that God gives us. Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, verse 12, pop it up on the overhead. Now watch this. Now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you? Notice this. Many of you have prayed, what is God, what do you want me to do? God, do we get a divorce? Are we mismatched? No one could be more mismatched than Deborah and I. The woman, by, by just her nature, is powerful, strong, independent thinker. Absolutely, for her to submit to the things of God, she's got to literally have God first. And she has after all these 35 years of ministry. And it's an amazing thing. We're always asking God, God, what is it you want from me? Here's the first and foremost thing that God wants from you, and you've got to make this decision yourself tonight. He says, here, Lord, what is required of you? But to fear the Lord, your God. First thing he says, because without the fear of God, that reverence, that respect, that awe of who he is, that fear of doing things the wrong way and having his chastisement in your life, without that man, you're going to find yourself having a problem. Then he comes along and he says, walk in all of his ways and love him and serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. You'll never walk in all of his ways. You'll never love him. You'll never serve him with all of your heart and all of your soul until you do the very first thing. First thing is getting into a place of realizing you got to get out of the way and let God in. Because without you getting out of the way, you live this selfish life where the world rotates around your feelings instead of the world rotating around what God says. Listen to me. If you're going to find out what God says about your marriage and you're going to do it, you're going to have to get out of yourself in order to do it. If you don't reverence and respect God, you will never do it. You'll never walk in his way. You'll never love him enough. You'll never serve him enough. The very first thing he says before you walk and before you love and before you serve is that you reverence. And most of us reverence God until God bothers us. Until God does something he requires of us that's contrary to our own lifestyles or wants or will or plan. And you know, when you do something that's contrary to your own will and plan because you do it because of God, that's an honor to the Lord. That's a burnt sacrifice that you just gave to God and you happen to be that which is burnt. But when you stand up and say, I'm not going to do it God's way. I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to operate that way. Then what you're saying is I'm now still on the throne and God isn't and I really don't respect Respect God enough to do what he has to say. Listen to this. It's so important for us. Joshua, it doesn't stop right there. The, the uh, 24th chapter of Joshua. In fact, take a look at verse number 14. Pop it up. Now, therefore, first thing. See, before you do anything, you've got to get this fear problem of fearing, respecting, reverencing God first and foremost in your life. This is not about your feelings. It's not about some human formula. This is not about you do this and you do that and you do this and you do that. Here's what it's about. It's about you. Number one thing is that you become so fearful of God and respect God so much that you would no more in a million years consider doing anything except what God wants. And if you do, then you're selfish and back to yourself again and away from the things of God. Fear God. Then he comes along, serve him. And then he says, uh, uh, sincerely and in truth, put away the gods of your father. See the way it says, I should have highlighted this, John, I don't know if you're back there or not. See where it says, put away the gods of your fathers. You know what the gods of their fathers were? Self-exaltation. Everything was done for themselves. It was, it was selfishness. Everything was built around them. It was their idols, their thoughts about God, their ways of serving God. You can't serve God your way, your idols, your things of doing and call it God. You got to do it his way. 
And for some of us, we have not left the gods of our fathers. We still have idols on the throne of our life. We still have our own feelings, our own wants, our own desires. We're no more a burnt offering than the man in the moon. And we'll be a burnt offering, we'll let the preacher talk about it, but that's not the way it's going to be in my life. In my life, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do what I feel. And boy, she better get in line with it, or he better get in line with it, or I'm out of here. When in fact, God God's looking for us to fear the Lord, then the rest of it comes into play. Right past the book of, uh, uh, of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastics. Go there with me, and if you'll go to the Ecclesiastics, and then let's take a look, if you will, in um, the, I think it's the 12th or 14th chapter in, in, uh, in the Word of God. Let's take a look at the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes. In verse number 13, it said, us, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here's the bottom line for every one of us. If you want to have a great marriage, you're going to have to evaluate where you're at with God, not with each other. Wait a minute, let me say that again. If you're going to have a great marriage, you have to evaluate where you're at with God, not with each other. There are times when I want to knock Deborah out. <laughs> and there's times when she probably wants to, me to be knocked out. And I have to be honest with you. She's different. She's tough. She's strong. She's not someone to back off. She's not someone, I mean, I'm like John Wayne's son. And she's like, you know, the women's lib follower. We're like two people that should not be married. You know how some people get together and they hardly wait to be married. We love the same ice cream. Or, uh, uh, we all like apple pie. And I uh, know this is destiny, man. We both love, uh, everybody loves Raymond. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing except the word of God that clicks between Deborah and I. That's it. We're totally, completely opposite. Deborah can make me so mad. And I find myself when I'm mad and angry, it's just a selfish expression because I want my way and I want it done my timing and I want it done the way I think it ought to be done. And I have to get off of my own personal selfishness and get on to what God says in order to operate correctly in the marriage. And when I don't, we fight like crazy. But when we do... The fight's gone, and all of a sudden, love is there again. Deborah is a 4-0 in economics in college. 4-0 economics. She can't even keep a checkbook. It drives me nuts. I will go months and months and even years where I'm, she says, and she says it like this, there's no money, there's no money. I'm going, where'd the money go? Where'd the money go? Where'd the money go? And then she's, she's so bad at accounting that she doesn't close, she, she, here's what she does. She keeps that open checkbook and then she starts a new checking account. And she'll use the new checking account and finally, four months later, figure out what checks came out and now that's the balance. And years and months go by. That's how she does it. This is a 4-0 in economics. One, one time, years back, she found $22,000 in the checking account. I'm thinking to myself, I've been starving for months. <laughs> I wanted to kill her. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And she's going, oh, isn't this wonderful? And I'm going, no, I've had a year of misery. <laughs> I always figured this, if anything had ever happened to me, she could get a job with the government. She's better than all of them, that's for sure. <laughs> she finds money where they lose it and spend it. <laughs> The whole thing comes down to the bottom line is in order for this to work, you're going to have to get out of yourself. It's not about her operating in a certain way, and if she operates a certain way, then I can love her like Christ loved the church, or me doing certain things. It's because of what God says. Ecclesiastes says, let us come to this, because the whole matter, right off the bat, fear God, 
and keep his commandments, his word. For this is man's all. Right off the bat, again, talking about the fear of the Lord. Let me put it to you in the New Testament terms, which is really fascinating. Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse number 28. Verse 28 says, Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. In other words, let me tell you something. This world has nothing to fear. You don't have to be afraid of a thing. You don't have to be afraid of the devil. But here's what he tells you and I to fear. Fear God. Listen to this. But rather fear him. Notice the capital H on the word him referring to God. Who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, the ultimate answer for your life has got to be what God says, not the way your spouse acts, not the way they look, not the way they treat you, but what God says. And if you can't do that, then friends, let me tell you something, then two things take place. One, you really don't reverence God like you're supposed to, and you're operating in a spirit of selfishness. And that in itself will destroy you and your marriage and everything else. And you've got to get out of yourself and get into God and so reverence God that when God speaks, that's the way it is. Now, I'm going to take you to Ephesians in the fifth chapter. I'm going to read to you the four commandments and the eight commandments. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Starting in verse number 21. Ephesians 5, 21 Submit to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wife be to their own husband in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself as a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, verse 33, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. One translation says reverence her husband. What I just read to you is four commandments to the wife and eight commandments to the husband. We're over the next number of weeks going to be going through all of these. But I want to share one verse with you tonight because I, without this one verse... None of the rest works. Are you ready? Verse 21, pop it up on the overhead. Submitting one to another. How in the world do I submit to someone who I think is wrong? How do I submit to somebody who's bugging me? How do I submit to someone? Submitting one to another. You heard many times that a wife's supposed to submit to your husband. And guess what? You will hear that and understand what it really means when Deborah is teaching the word of God. But here it says to one another. And it says submitting to one another. In other words, the husband submits to the wife. The wife submits to the husband. There's a time to give in. There's a time to work together. There's a time to let her be what she is. There's a time to let him be what he is. How in the world can I possibly do that? That's the problem, Pastor, everybody says. I have a difficult time right there. She doesn't believe in me. She doesn't listen to me. She doesn't follow me. She says, he doesn't love me, he doesn't respect me, he doesn't treat me right, he loved me and courted me when we were getting married. After we were married, man, he ate wedding cake and that was it. <laughs> Submitting one to another. 
It isn't done because the person acts right. It isn't done because they're good or nice or have great personalities. You don't submit one to another because they do what you want them to do. Most likely they're not going to from time to time. You submit one to another, <clears throat> here's the word, in the fear of God. Because of who God is and what God says for you to do. And that's what this is really all about. Without the fear of God governing your mouth and your lifestyle and your actions, then who is going to govern your mouth, lifestyle, and actions? You. Only thing you'll ever do is what you've been trained to do. You'll do what your parents did. You'll do what television sitcoms will tell you, movies and marriages like that, instead of doing what God says. Because, listen to this, it's in the fear of God that Deborah and I have stayed together and fought a good fight of faith. It's in the fear of God when we're angry with each other that we stay in love with each other. It's because of the fear of God that we don't use the word divorce. It's not an option. You heard the old saying, divorce is not an option. Murder is definitely one of the things we're considering. <laughs> but then you've got to go back to the scripture that says, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Which is murder, really. And so you can't get, you can't get by that way. And if there's such a reverence for who God is, then all of a sudden you act according to what God says, not according to what the partner does. I hope you got that. You act and respond according to what God says, not according to what the partner does. There's no doubt about it. If you base your future on your partner, there probably won't be a partnership or a marriage but if you base your future on what God has because you reverence God so much and you're the burnt offering that you're offering as a sacrifice to God and you get yourself out of the way and get so you're not selfish that that wife or that husband becomes one that's first and foremost because now you're doing what God says and once you learn those four and those eight principles that are in the Word of God, and you start practicing them, all of a sudden marriage starts to become fun again. Because you didn't know this, but during courtship period of time, you were probably doing just that. And it's only after you're married for a long period of time you forget about how exciting the marriage is. There's times when I've called my kids many times and said, you know what? Your mother's driving me nuts. And I complain to my kids, you know, and I'm thinking, now am I going to go into counseling with Pastor Dan? <laughs> and Jessica? Or are I going to stop and do what the Word of God has to say? And I have to jerk myself back to doing what the Word of the Lord has to say. Why? Because I fear God. The same with Deborah. You know, she's living with somebody who's opinionated, got his own ideas, old enough to be cranky, have rights to be cranky, like being cranky. <laughs> and she says, you're a cranky old man. But she operates like a godly woman because she loves God more than me. The first attraction I ever had with Deborah after three horrible divorces was that I saw that she loved God more than me. To this day, she loves God more than me. Someday, Deborah will die and join her real husband in heaven. And his name is Jesus. That's what this is all about. In the meantime, she's leased to me. 
And in order not to send her to her real husband early, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you guys? I've got to learn how to do the Word of God, and it starts with reverence. Reverence never works unless you're a burnt offering. Unless you respect God more than your own feelings. Reverence will never work until you are out of the way and God is first on the throne of your life. And there's nobody else sitting on that throne but God. And when you get on the throne with God or get on the throne and kick him off and do it your way, the marriage is destined for failure. And you failed, not God. You failed, not God. So God makes this statement, submitting to one another in the fear of reverence, respect, and awe of who God is. Now, for most of you that are in here, you have not gotten there yet. Let's be honest with each other. You have not gotten to the place where you respect God so much that you, whatever he says I'll do, whatever I can do, I'll be there. I mean, you have a relationship with God for the most part, a lot of you that are in here, and you need to look at yourself based on who God is as long as it doesn't disrupt your own personal feelings. And somebody needs to tell you that's wrong. Somebody needs to tell you that's pride. And it will, selfishness, that will never get you anywhere. In fact, stop and think about the original sin, which was really not in the garden, but in heaven. A lot of people think it was in the garden with Adam and Eve. It took place a long time before that with Lucifer in heaven. Here he was, this cherub. I don't know what he was, but he was probably a song leader in heaven, a one who managed, listen to this, the Bible tells us that Lucifer managed the resources of God Almighty himself. He was like the administrator of heaven. And all of a sudden, all he did is he wanted to have self-direction. And he wanted to be like God, watch this, aside from God. And oftentimes, we take that satanic principle, we apply it in our life. We want to be the one on the throne. We want to be the one in control. We want our feelings to be appeased. And what happens, guys, here's what takes place, is that you have nothing but a satanic principle operating in your life. Lucifer was thrown out of heaven because now his heart was directed back to his own feelings more than that of God. Now here's the question. Here's a great question. God Almighty who throws out Lucifer for heaven because Lucifer was connected with himself and wanted to be above God or at least the same as God but beside God, not with God. Let me tell you something. When you operate independent like that by yourself, do you think God gets in line with it and says it's okay? Do you think God's going to let you in heaven when you have that independent spirit? He just threw him out of heaven because he had an independent spirit. And here we come along and we haven't yet found ourselves so in love with God that whatever he says, he's a just God, a God of respect, a God that do uh, to him is reverence in every area, and a God of awe and a God to be feared. And oh no, instead of that, we say, God, here we are. I want my own personal way. Now watch that. That's called pride. Interesting, isn't it? I want to take you to the last verse tonight. I think you'll find it fascinating. Go with me, if you will, into Proverbs. In Proverbs, take a look with me in the 13th chapter, verse number 10 of Proverbs. Pop it up on the overhead. By pride comes nothing. By pride comes nothing. Wait a minute. This sums the whole thing up tonight. This is why you fight. This is why you argue. 
This is why you fall out of love with each other. This is why you want to be away from each other. This is why you want to give up. And listen to the verse. By pride comes nothing but strife. One translation says, by pride comes nothing but contention. When you're contending back and forth, do you know what I'm talking about, married couples? When you're contending back and forth, there's a battle going on. She says something, he says something. She says something, he says something. She says something, he says something. He finally shuts up, she wants the last word. Then you give her the last word and it ain't the last word. Brings you back into it again. I know what it's like, it's called contention. And when that takes place, guess what's in the middle of it? Pride, personal selfishness, your own self on the throne instead of God. It's the very thing that lost Lucifer's relationship with God, and it's the very thing that'll stop your marriage. And until there's the lack of pride, lack of selfishness, lack of self-exaltation, and you get into a place that your whole life is governed because you fear God more than you fear your wife. You fear God more than you fear your husband. Can I say this to you? Life is not going to work. And until we get out of our selfish position and we become a burnt offering, then God starts to prosper and bless your life. Bless your marriages. Love starts to flow back in your marriage. All of a sudden, you can hardly wait to be together. My goodness. By pride comes nothing. Selfishness, self-exaltation, contention you have, holding up your end, thinking you're right, and you might very well be, isn't the issue. The issue is whether or not you will submit to the things of God because you fear him, respect him, and reverence him. Not whether or not your partner changes. Your partner will eventually change. You will divorce each other, and you will change partners if you don't get pride out of your life and put God first and get your selfishness out of the way. When I want to fight with Deborah, pride, I say, oh my goodness, pride makes me want to be contentious. And nothing comes. Nothing comes by pride except strife. And that's why marriages have strife, because you haven't learned to fear God more than your own personal self. You're still on the throne of your life instead of God being on the throne of of your life. So when he makes a statement, submit one to another in the fear of God, it goes in one ear and out the other, and you have no foundation for operating in the eight and the four. And you need to make a commitment that says, I'm going to do it God's way, not my way. I'm going to be that burnt offering, even though it frustrates me. I'm going to shut up instead of giving something snide back. An answer comes back like, what can I do for you? I'm here to help you. I'm here to be a blessing. And Man, that takes, for us men, that's a tough thing to do. Because we want that woman to line up with our feelings. And that's the way it used to be in the world, but it is not that way with God. And that's the problem. Until we reverence God more than our own respect and reverence for ourselves, we will never be able to apply the word of God in marriage. And it's your call, not mine. Now, before I go any further tonight, I'm finished, but that's this first week, setting a foundation of reverence for God because you're going to start learning those principles. You can't apply them until you realize you're not doing them because your wife does them or your husband does them. You're going to do them because you love God so much you've got to do them. See, without that, you're going to wait for the wife and husband to line up, and it won't happen. You'll end up divorced. Is anybody listening? 
Here's what I want to do. Before you get started, some of you need to get right with God. I'm not talking about getting right with God in your marriage. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm talking about getting right with God right off the bat. You need to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. You need to be born again. Headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. And the only way to do that is you're going to give God all of your heart. You're going to give God all of your life. Listen to me. Without that, nothing from God ever works. This Bible is written to believers. Someone said one time, well, that part's believers, that part's unbelievers. Unbelievers don't read it. It's for believers. It's written to the church. People that are, have a relationship with God that want a better relationship with God. But some of you have really no relationship because you haven't given God totally all of your heart and all of your life. And if you have, you keep pulling it back all the time doing your own thing. And you need to give God all of your heart and you need to give God all of your life. And here we are tonight in this safe, friendly place. I couldn't have been more honest before you. I couldn't have been more blunt. I'm telling you the truth, and you know it. Now you need to respond in honesty and truth. And you need to give God all of your heart, and you need to give God all of your life. Before we go any further, I want to pray with you right where you're at. I'm not going to ask you to come up, because we're going to do that together in a moment. But this is a day, your day, of salvation, and you need to get right with God. Now, I know you already know who Jesus is. I know you, 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 uh, uh, you, know, you go celebrate Easter and Christmas, but this is not about celebrating Easter and Christmas. This is about you giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life, putting him on the throne of your life and not taking him off. Man, that's what held our marriage together for 35 years. And it's been a great, loving marriage. I can hardly wait. I've seen her in four or five days. We're texting each other every 10 minutes. We can hardly wait to see each other. Today I stand before you and tell you this works. And that I love Deborah more today than I ever did in my entire life. We are in love. We are, it's a love story from heaven because the way we act is from heaven. And when we don't act like we're from heaven, then that falls apart completely. So tonight, those of you that haven't given God all of your heart and all of your life, you know who you are. You're in this place, you're saying, wow, I call myself a Christian. Yeah, but that doesn't make you a Christian until you have given freely your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. You have to give it to him. He won't steal it from you because he's not a conniver. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. He's not someone to hit you in the head with a two by four. It's your call to give God all of your heart and all of your life. It's your call. Not mine, yours. I can't make you do it. Some of you have been lukewarm. What does that mean? You're still on the throne of your life. What does that mean? You're still the boss. What does that mean? It's still all about you. What does that mean? You're still alive, haven't died yet. What does that mean? You're not a burnt offering. You're still very much alive and everything that rotates around you and your thinking and you're not saved and somebody needs to tell you because there's no way God's going to kick out Lucifer and let you in. And you need to give God all of your heart and you need to give God all of your life. And that's what this is all about. And I'll pray with you right where you're at. But in order for you to make this statement, you're going to have to raise your hand. I want to know who you are. Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you. And you need to make a public statement. So I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to pop my hands on the Bible. Just right here, bang. When you hear that sound, bang. Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand, and right where you're at, we'll pray a prayer. Then after church, come get some free literature from Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel, raise your hand. But right now, I'm going to pray with you right where you're at. Is that okay? I'm going to count to three who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, 
make sure tonight is your night. Let me just say it in San Bernardino language. Cut out the bull with God. He knows where you're at, and let's get right. Because it's your call. He's already done all he's going to do. When he went to the cross and died for you and paid the price for you. Now it's time for you to do your job. And give him all of your heart. Give him all of your life. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hand on the Bible. When I do, you get your hand up and I'll pray with you right where you're at. And then afterwards, I'll give you some free information to take home and read about what you've just done and what you should be doing afterwards. Are you ready? All across this auditorium. I won't embarrass you, but if you are embarrassed, too bad. Better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever. Today is your day of salvation. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Come on, 22, where are you? 23, back over there. Thank you, God bless you. Anybody else? 24, thank you. 25, God bless you. Put your hands on. I already saw you guys. I already saw you. 25, anybody else? Anybody else? 26, 27, 28. Going to go for God. Listen, starts with reverence. Starts with respect. You can't do things your way anymore. You're going to have to do things his 28, thank you, back in the family room. Now everybody, here's what I want you to do that raised your hand, and everybody in the room, I want you to stand to your feet, and let's pray together. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, all 28 of you. I want you to say this out loud, and everybody, let's join in with them. There's people making a heart commitment to Jesus tonight. It's a very serious thing. Not something to play with. Very serious. So everybody say these words. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Everybody say these words out loud. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son. I believe you sent him for me. I believe he died for me. I believe his blood washes away my sins. I receive Jesus now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. And I give you all of my heart and all of my life. Jesus, thank you. I am, as of now and forever, a Christian. I'm born again. I'm alive forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. I'm a king's kid. I will live by your word and not my ways. Thank you, Jesus. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saved. Now give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. 
Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.